uh, for coming. So. Now, you know, I'm introducing uh, Matteo Scandi. He's my, uh, my academic brother. We have the same, uh, have the same easy advisor, as I'm thing. And uh, I understand that maybe your thesis was about uh, thermodynamics. Yeah. Thermodynamics, right? Uh, he recently wrote a review, which I mean, really review with uh, Paul Rock, uh, Paolo. And uh, we were asking in the, the group meeting about it. And then we talked about how, how it, it, it develops this idea, right? I mean, I think we didn't talk about it. We're all curious about what, uh, what one, one can do with the, with the quantum missing information. So, yeah, you're about to finish your PhD, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a postdoc, maybe? Or? No, I already have the postdoc for, 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 for this year, but next year I'm open to okay. any position. <laughs> okay, so you're going to start. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And uh, as Miguel was saying, I'm uh, from the group of Tania Sin in Barcelona. And together with the, the rest of the team, uh, we had recently an uh, archive. Good. <laughs> Uh, what do we do? <laughs> I don't know, it's like... <laughs> okay, now no, it, it's back there. <laughs> No, no signal again. <laughs> Maybe you could, could you pass your talk here? Maybe yeah, just, uh, possibly. Mm. Yeah, okay. Mm. Let's see if it works. No, no. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, do you have a pen drive? Uh, so, uh, okay. No, the, the, this I think it's uh, okay, for. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. What's happening? It's very difficult to write this. Let's see who managed first. Not, I don't know why it's not transferring. <laughs> Should you have it? Uh, can I send it to you by email, maybe? Because it's <laughs> not, not, not there. Is that what? You don't find it or what? No, no, I can find it, but it's like, I don't know, like, then it's not a able to transfer. M maybe this thing is broken. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. Okay, so yeah, send me, send me to my, send to my email, and then I. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Okay, 
No, it managed. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. So. It, yeah. And meanwhile, if anybody wants to guess the word, mm -hmm. then you can you can propose mm -hmm. this letter. Okay, you didn't make a... Okay. Oh, yeah. it was projector. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Hope that there are transitions, because otherwise it would be... Ooh, no, there are no transitions. Fuck, sorry, my problem. <laughs> Uh, can I do it again? <laughs> no, because I, I thought I transferred with transitions, but I see, I see. But, uh, I don't know, it's stupid. Sorry. Sparta. Cool. <laughs> Did you erase what was inside or? No, no. Well, I don't see anything else. So weird. Uh, yeah, man. I don't know what you did, but now I don't have anything. What the fuck? No, it's like I, I mean, I just drag and drop. Beautiful things I have there. Okay, maybe now. Well. Okay. Here we are, finally. <laughs> so, hello back. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I was saying, we recently put on the archive uh, a review, a long review on uh, quantum fissure information. And uh, let me present you the rest of the people here, Paula Buse in the first row. Uh, then there's Dario De Santis, who's now in, uh, in Pisa and uh, normale and uh, Jacopo Surace who's in perimeter i mean is in it for now he will go to perimeter institute in september so uh, since it's a long review i'll, I'll just give you some uh, uh, shameless uh, self promotion at the beginning and uh, if if you open the archive the first page looks like this and then you scroll to the second page you find uh, this long index and basically 
everything you want to know about this 60 pages long review is written here. Like, you don't need anything else. You just go there, and it's like there, it's full of hyperlinks, and uh, there's everything. It's like really uh, a, a summary of everything you need. Then another thing we use in this uh, paper to make it a bit more readable is uh, these uh, green boxes that tell you which is important, info, like the main part of the text and uh, some additional information in the, in the review. And now that we did uh, uh, imp uh, the useless self-promotion part, let's go to the physics. So uh, Fisher information is a, a statistical distance. So it is useful to, to give you a, an idea of what statistical distances might, might be. And I do this uh, with a game that is consider you have uh, this uh, sentence in a language that you don't know, and you want to guess uh, which language it is. So one way of doing it is you take an histogram of all the frequencies of the letters, and then you go to the closest library, you check statistical properties of languages, and there are two candidates that get really close to this one. One is Swedish, the other one is Finnish, but still, like, the most naive approach to uh, f finding the solution to this problem is just saying, okay, I overlap my histograms, and I see uh, which one fits the data best. But it's clearly not that easy, because there are different features in the statistical distribution that, like, this one fits better, and, and that one fits better other features. So, the way in which you solve this problem is uh, through uh, information theory. So we assume that languages uh, generate uh, strings of letters as a basically sampling from a, a distribution. But it, it works. <laughs> like, so it's like w first order assumption is like uh, the sampling is IID. So you, you sample from uh, th the language of writing it. Uh, uh, text, and then from this text, you generate an observed uh, statistics. So now the question is, can you, do, can you go the other way around? So you see the observed statistics, and you want to get something. So uh, using the ID uh, assumption, we say uh, that the probability of observing any uh, string x1, xn can be uh, factorized in a product of uh, independent uh, factors. And then, just because we like sums, uh, you can rewrite it in exponential form. And actually, this is particularly useful because if now you uh, divide and multiply by the number of uh, elements in your string, and the, element is, the number of elements is big enough, then you can apply the law of large number, and you know that the, this uh, sum, this mean, will actually converge to its average value according to the right uh, probability distribution, the underlying probability distribution. So now, what you can do is like using th this approximation to just uh, input back the relative entropy inside of uh, this exponential, and what you see is that uh, this quantity uh, quantifies how well your data uh, fits the uh, experiment uh, you're observing. So in our context, for example, uh, you do like the probability distribution for, for each or one of them, and then you compute the relative entropy between any of this distribution and the Observe it, observe data, and well, you have a winner. So this sentence is actually finished. So uh, the way th this is a way in which you can derive uh, the relative entropy, which is, uh, I mean, basically finding a strategy to compare the statistics of two distributions. But it's kind of arbitrary. It's like it's just one of the many strategies you can have. So starting from this, uh, CSAR uh, defined a whole family of possible divergences, it's called G divergences, 
uh, that basically encode the possible, the many possible ways in which you comp can compare different uh, probability distributions. And this is all classical. And at least at, at a classical level, uh, what is interesting is that this is a really big family, like it, it has basically uncountable many uh, possible uh, possibilities, but locally, uh, for, and locally I mean for probability distributions that really look the same, all this family collapse on a single object, and that we rewrite in this matrix form with a unique eta x, y defined like this. So it's a diagonal matrix, it's positive, and uh, it smoothly depends on the, on the base point. And this is actually what is called the Fisher information metric for uh, classical distribution. So uh, an interesting result you already have in, uh, for, for classical statistics is that for all possible contrast function, you have only one behavior uh, at a local level that is given by what is called the Fisher information metric. So uh, to give you a bit of an idea what this metric actually tells you, let's look at the uh, case of uh, Gaussian distributions. So th these are uh, probability distribution parameterized by two uh, numbers, mu and sigma, one giving you the average and the other one the, uh, the standard deviation. And basically, you can uh, describe the, the space of all Gaussians by a semiplane, because sigma can only be positive. And each one of the points on this uh, semiplane actually uh, corresponds to a dif different probability distribution. So for example, going down, you get more peak uh, distribution because the sigma becomes smaller and smaller. Going from right to left, the point of the average just changes accordingly. So in this context, if you do all the calculation, then you get that the Fisher information takes this form. And uh, the interesting part here is that tells you that there's this one over sigma square uh, dependence in front. And this is kind of uh, what you would expect because if sigma is really small, then you have almost delta distribution. So as soon as you see the average value of your delta, or of your Gaussian, you can uh, infer really well which mu it, it, uh, it corresponds to. So it's like th this dependence already tells you like some uh, uh, properties of the distribution. Moreover, th this is also a, a model for hyperbolic space. So we have all the geodesics there. And here geodesics means that locally uh, what you're doing is like changing the distribution in such a way that uh, locally, you don't see that much of a statistical change. Even if you, if you are actually changing the distribution, maybe even in a radical way. For example, here, if you go like uh, one geodesic are the uh, vertical lines in which you just increase the noise in your distribution. Other geodesics are semicircles. And this is like a response to the idea that if you want to change the uh, average value of your Gaussian, the best way is actually first increase the, the noise in your Gaussian, so you kind of forget, like, I mean, you lose information about your initial state, and then eventually you go back to a peak distribution again. So all of this was just statistical in nature, but there's a, a property that uh, Fisher information has, and well, all statistical distances that kind of make sense should have, that is, uh, they decrease under noise. What does it mean by this? Well, take the, uh, the sentence we had before, and then you start like applying some uh, transformation that lose progressively information about what your, what your original language is. Then doing this, for example here, uh, the A with umlaut disappear, you lose information about your original language because all the languages kind of collapse to the same model. So Fisher information has this property 
that is contractive under uh, noisy transformation. But not only that. It, there's a famous theorem in, in this context called Chenstoff theorem that tells you that among all the possible metrics you can have on probability space, Fisher information is the only one that contracts under arbitrary noisy transformation. So uh, th this should be contrasted with the, the other way in which we derived uh, Fisher information that was from a purely statistical point of view. You say, I have all possible strategies that I can compare to statistical distribution with, but locally they collapse to the same object. Well, there's a, a purely dynamical uh, explanation of this, like, uh, sorry, characterization of the same object that tells you that the only metric that actually contracts um, under stochastic maps is the Fisher, Fisher information, the same object. So we also have the same property for uh, quantum maps. And everything I will say in this talk will be basically classical. But just want to uh, tell you, it's like the, the reason why we don't do quantum here is just for clarity. Because, uh, for example, the relative entropy we had, uh, sorry, the contrast function we had before, now transform into these other objects in which uh, this bold uh, L and R are left and right of, uh, multiplication operators. So like, you don't have to know what th these are. Uh, but th the interesting part is that this unique uh, metric we had before now becomes uh, a whole family of different super operators that are parameterized by this F and this it's like uh, gives a, a bit of complication when you want to write things explicitly. So uh, in this regard, I just must say that here, uh, this family of JEF comes from uh, the, local, the, the local behavior of uh, the corresponding contrast function. There's a way to connect them. But also, this is the same family that Pat's theorem uh, singles out. So it's the same family that contracts under uh, arbitrary uh, stochastic uh, uh, CPTP maps. So to give you an idea of why we don't do this, this is like a table you can find the paper. It's really useful if you want to just check whether what you have is a Fisher metric, but it's like forget about it. I'll give you four examples that are particularly notable. One is the Burris metric here that uh, basically whenever in physics you read about a Fisher metric, they mean this one. This other one is uh, it's really it's like called Kubomori for, uh, metric. It's uh, really useful for thermodynamic transformations. Uh, this one is very used for uh, defining a, a path, sorry, a bias, uh, a bias map for uh, quantum dynamics. And this last one, I'll just give you because all the other three, if you see, are CPV maps, because they are already in Krauss form, but this is not necessary. So it's like, this last one is not in Krauss form, so you know that it's not generic, the fact that uh, Fisher information are CP. So now that you saw the complicated part, let's go to the most fun part. That is, uh, why is this object interesting? So, so far, uh, we saw that there's a statistical approach to Fisher information. And then there's the dynamical one that was a bit overlooked during the years. So I'll give you the first uh, result of, the, uh, of our paper that is the following. Consider any linear map, non non uh, trace non-increasing, that satisfies three properties. Uh, first, it's full rank. That means just it's invertible. Then it has to map one state in another state, at least one. And then contracts the Fisher information on the image. So just to give you, like, since this is the main theorem, I'll explain you what, what each one of these means. So consider the space of state. Then you have a map that acts like this. So you have basically the map 
well, invertible, you can see it from here, but it has the second uh, condition is that at least a part of this overlap is non-zero. So there's at least one state that is mapped into another state. And secondly, uh, if you only focus on the part that like intersection of this image with the space of state in there, where you can actually define a Fisher information, you, you have a contraction of uh, the Fisher metric. If you have these three condition, well, what turns out is that uh, the image of phi is actually completely contained in the space of state. So this picture is wrong. The right one is like this. And th this is kind of a strong result because first we had that the Fisher information was characterized as the only metric that contracted uh, under any uh, physical evolution. And now we have the dual result that is all among all the possible maps you can have, the physical ones are exactly the one that contract the Fisher metric. And here, a physical uh, is true for classical state, but since this results, uh, this result uh, holds the, the same also for quantum state, you just need to adjoin uh, an extra copy of the state to distinguish between a CP map and a P map. Because of course, a positive map is the same as a completely positive map if you lock, only look at one copy of the space of states. So uh, we have some uh, application of this result. First was to the study of uh, non-Markovianity. And for, for the people who don't know, uh, non-Markovianity can be described as the following. It's like you take uh, a state rho, you couple it with, a, with an environmental state, and then you apply a unitary on top of everything. This is the definition of basically the most general, uh, completely positive map you can have. Then you trace out uh, the state, and you have uh, basically th this map that depends on uh, the s, the time s at which you stop your evolution, and kind of gives you how rho evolves in time. Now, if you want to continue the evolution to a later time, you cannot do it at this level. You have to go back, or at least not trace uh, out the environmental state, continue the evolution, and then you have a final state phi of t. So one, uh, these two are by construction CP maps. And by, one might wonder whether there's an intermediate map sending you from here to there in such a way that also this third, like the, this third proper uh, quantity is actually CP. Well, maybe surprisingly, this is the definition of Markovianity. It's like uh, not all the maps, not all the intermediate maps are uh, RCP, and actually only the intermediate maps that correspond to a Markovian evolution are the RCP. So uh, to give you uh, like kind of an intuition of why this is the case, suppose they, that uh, the intermediate map is actually physical, then what you have is that uh, you can actually evolve your state for some time s, and then there's another environmental state, sigma two, and another unitary u tilde that actually implements this intermediate map. So the one going from here to here. So uh, if this is the case, we say it's Markovian. Suppose it's not the case. Uh, then somewhere here, th there's something that bro breaks down. So in some w what we know is that you can pass from uh, this state to this state, but not from this state to this state. And uh, if you look at the structure of what you have here is that like the only difference is that there's a environmental state uh, 
here that was traced out here. So uh, what we have is that the evolution, in order to be physical, needs some information that was stored on the environmental state to continue uh, progressing in time. So the, this is what it's usually referred to as a, a backflow of information. So you need, like in the first part of the evolution, you take some information about the initial condition, you give it to the, uh, to the environment, and then you need to take it back somehow. So uh, now that you have some kind of evolution of the, what normal reality is, suppose we have uh, like the, the same picture as before. So this map is CP, that map is CP, and the intermediate map is actually not. So applying uh, the main theorem of, uh, of our paper, we, we find that uh, contractivity actually implies Markovianity on this uh, ad like adjointed uh, space. And this is kind of uh, surprising if you come from a non-Markovian uh, background, because the most common uh, quantifier there is uh, the trace distance, defined like this. And uh, in that context, you have that uh, the expansion of, uh, sorry, the contraction of, Markov of trace distance is not equivalent to Markovianity, if you look only at this uh, space of states, tensor space of states. Still, uh, there's uh, something funny happening here. That is, if you ask now, can you operationally witness Markovianity, the situation kind of reverts. So uh, it is well known in the literature that with the trace distance, you can prepare uh, two states here times some ancilla. And then at a later time, you see if there's no Markovianity, an increase in the statistical distance. On the other hand, uh, if the, since the fissure is so strongly dependent on the base point, the fact that uh, the expansion of the, uh, of the fissure metric can happen outside of the, of the image doesn't tell you anything about what it's doing inside of the uh, uh, space of, like, of the image of phi. So uh, actually what we find is that for the Fisher uh, metric, even if it's kind of more powerful for definition of what uh, Markovianity is, it's less powerful when it comes to witnessing no Markovianity. Because you need some post-processing in order to uh, actually uh, witness uh, the, the expansivity of your, of your map. So, uh, Markov like Markovianity, as I was saying, tells you uh, that the environment kind of gives you back some information about your initial state. But now, w what I was discussing was the expansion of statistical distances. So it's uh, somehow, uh, it if you are new to, to the subject, might look unrelated. It's like, first we have uh, a single object uh, quantity, that is like the information about your initial state goes back in, in uh, like you take some information about your initial state from the environment. In, that, in this other case, you have an expansion and contraction of the of statistical distances that are two objects kind of, uh, uh, property. So, to uh, connect like the, like this conceptual gap, like to cover this conceptual gap, consider this uh, kind of uh, scenario. So you take two states, pi and pi plus delta, where delta is small, and uh, the first part of your evolution is CP, so the, uh, the states go get closer. And then at a later time, you have non cpness such that actually these states expand. It needs not to be the case, but if this the case, uh, we say there's an expansion of the Fisher metric on the image. And the interesting point is that the Fisher information gives you a canonical way of retrodicting your initial state. 
through basically a, a generalization of what b bias theorem is. With this canonical uh, uh, way, uh, slight construction, you can retrodict both from here and from here, and in the presence of uh, uh, expansivity of the Fisher metric, you actually see, you can prove that uh, the distance at a later time becomes smaller. So w what we have here is that thanks to this construction, the presence of no Markovianity allows to guess your initial state better than if all the evolution would be Markovian. So th this is a really like a backflow of information about your initial state. So uh, the last topic I uh, want to cover is uh, the definition of detailed balance. So con uh, since this is kind of more dynamical, it's like more thermodynamics property, let's look at it uh, closely. Consider a Markov chain with only two states, i and j, and each one comes with the, its own uh, uh, pop population. And then you have some rates in which you jump from one uh, state to the other. So uh, we can define in this context a uh, rate matrix that basically tells you how uh, the population of each state changes in time and basically encodes these uh, coefficients A. And then all such matrices have a fixed point, pi, which will be like the equilibration point. So uh, suppose now you are at equilibrium. Everything we said is generic. What detailed balance means is that this condition uh, is satisfied. So basically, if you read it, it's like if you interpret it, this is uh, the probability of this jump, so the probability of being in state i and then jumping to j is symmetric with respect to time. So it, it's the same as the probability of finding yourself in j and then jumping forward. So if you just uh, take the definition, this uh, mathematically takes this form. And uh, what we can see is that you can rewrite it in, in this complicated form with the eta, uh, the Fisher information matrix from before, and forgetting about uh, like the formula, this is just telling you that the rate matrix is self-adjoint with respect to uh, the generator, uh, with the Fisher information matrix. So uh, this is uh, the, the classical part. And uh, in here, you see that self-adjointness with respect to the, uh, to the Fisher metric is exactly equivalent to being detail balance. For quantum detail balance, the situation gets slightly more complicated. So uh, this, context, uh, this concept was defined for the first time in Bialyski, 1976. And funnily enough, this is something of a lesser known fact, you also used a, a scalar product. So this one is not in the Fisher family, unfortunately. But he also said, if you take a Limbladian dynamics and uh, you, you check its property with respect to a scalar product, well, it has to be self-adjoint. And this is equivalent, he proves, to this uh, structural uh, the definition that is the most canonical one. It's like if you open the Petruccione theory of open quantum system, you find this one, not the other. So now uh, we enter the game and we want to see whether uh, our definition is equivalent to other three. So it's like whether saying that uh, a Limbladian or let's say the dissipator of the Limbladian is self-adjoint with respect to the Fisher information, it's uh, equivalent to what Aliski was doing in there. So this question was already posed some uh, 10 years ago. And um, if you only choose one F, actually uh, you get uh, conditions of being detail balanced that are inequivalent between one and the other. So like different Fs gives you 
different conditions. And on top of that, they're all weaker than the, the one by Eliski. So that means the one by Eliski implies the other one, but not the, uh, not the other way around. But since we, we thought like uh, Fisher information are a unique family, they should all be considered at the same time. And if you do so, you have a theorem that tells you in the, that if the Hamiltonian doesn't have degenerate gaps, well, all the three uh, conditions are equivalent. So now what happens if you have degenerate gaps? Well, th there are three possible transitions. And uh, to do so, we uh, rewrite this, a possible state in a block matrix kind of way, in which if you see here, pi alpha and pi beta are the population of, uh, of your steady state. And you impose this condition between uh, the, uh, like, alpha, beta, and gamma, delta, like the defining coordinates of these two uh, blocks. So th uh, the possible transition you can have are first among the diagonal e elements. And here we just highlight once, but actually also between all the other diagonal elements th there are. And this satisfy the classical uh, uh, definition of detailed balance, which bringing uh, one of the population to the other side can be rewritten like this. So there's another possible uh, transition in the, uh, for quantum uh, uh, maps that is basically connecting the coherent terms, this one with this one, and uh, the other one is like, this other term with this other term. And uh, the interesting uh, part here is that also uh, these rates satisfy the uh, detailed balance condition with the same e to the power minus omega. And up until this point, this is the same definition as Aliski. It's like this part is already present in the more canonical definition. We actually found though that uh, this is not the same we have in the presence of uh, non-degenerate uh, gaps. And there's a, another channel in which Koreans can talk that is basically a kind of cross term in which this term can speak with this term and this term can speak with this term. And something interesting we found is that uh, despite the fact that you have an, an additional channel, this is still satisfying the same kind of classical uh, detailed balance condition. So in some way, uh, the Fisher information treats uh, the coherences in, in a more symmetric way. It's like it doesn't give you uh, a preference between these transitions and this transition. Something that instead, like the most canonical this, uh, definition does. So uh, it was a lot, so uh, I'll just give you a, a brief recap of everything we saw. Uh, first, and most importantly, uh, we have this result that being a physical map, it's in one to one with uh, contracting the fissure. So the classical result of chance of path about the characterization of the fissure can be actually reverted to give you the, uh, a characterization that only speaks about something that was in principle a statistical uh, distance. And this, uh, I guess, could be interesting for people doing uh, reconstruction for quantum theory, because it basically gives you a way of defining evolutions just in terms of uh, basically information theory. Secondly, uh, we have basically a, co a complete characterization for the relation between Fisher information and Markovianity. Then we saw that uh, there's a canonical construction uh, that connects the, uh, like the backflow of information given by quantum non-Markovianity to uh, an ability of an agent to guess the initial state better and better with time. 
And finally, we saw that uh, detail balance, that is something that in principle has nothing to do again with the uh, statistical properties. And it's, it was apparently just uh, a dynamical property of, uh, of your evolution. Well, can be explained in terms of uh, self-adjointness with respect to the Fisher information. So this was all I had to say. Thanks for your attention. I mean, uh, so the thing is, I tell you, if you have a, a linear map that is trace non increasing, so it's like there's a, already a lot of structure, then physical evolutions are the ones that contract uh, the Fisher information. So it's like, I mean, you already have to have at least the Hilbert space uh, formalism. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, b basically, th this is something, uh, okay, so, in uh, classical theory, you can define bias retrodiction, like, uh, literally, like the bias map that tells you how to uh, guess your initial state from uh, the observed data just in terms of uh, Fisher information. It's like it's uh, literally basically uh, using the Fisher information to kind of, uh, well, I mean, th th there's a map that, that does that and it's expressed only in, in terms of that. Quantum mechanically, it's not that uh, uncontroversial, let's say, but there's a, at least one most canonical way that is the path recovery map that is again expressed in terms of uh, uh, Fisher information. And this connection actually helps you to map the statistical distances that you would observe in, in time to uh, like how the statistical distance at the or origin of time would behave. So basically th there's a canonical map that allows you to map the, any state close to a prior state back in time. Like, it allows you to uh, map this one back here and this one back here. And if there's a, a Markovianity, what you see is that your guess gets worse and worse with time. It's like, basically, your guess will, at some point, you will just say, uh, the initial condition was the prior because you lost any information about the, the initial condition. But if you have no Markovianity, then the distance between your guess and the initial condition gets smaller in, if there's a contraction on the, sorry, expansion on the image. Yeah, no, it's like, I mean, basically, at least quantumly is, uh, sorry, at least classically, it's uncontroversial what we are doing. We are really doing uh, bias theorem. Quantumly, what is funny about this result is that you don't even need a CP map doing the, the prediction. We, we find that there are, like, mathem just mathematical constructions that allows you to kind of map the scalar product at this time to the scalar product at this time, and they are kind of canonical in a sense. It's so like, I mean, they have some parameters in it, but once you have fixed them, uh, it's like they contract under CP maps, and even if they are not even physical. So it's like, I, I mean, the, it's, the quantum version is a bit 
weird, let's say. So like, but at least the pets recovery, that's uncon uncontroversial for how much uncontroversial bias theorem in quantum mechanics can be. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, so b basically, I'm not a Markovian guy, so I, I will try to kind of sell you something that is not mine. Uh, but the, the idea is that in the presence of no Markovianity, the, the error you accumulate with time at some point gets erased. And there, there's, for example, a really nice example that. Uh, uh, th there's a, a really nice idea in this context that saying uh, you want to keep some information away from uh, any ice dropper, uh, is dropper, and you first put it in your state, then you use a non-Markovian uh, evolution to disperse it, uh, disperse it into an environment, and then this Markovian evolution has some backflow, but just at the right time. So it's like, for any time, you would look like, like your state will be fully mixed, and then uh, at the right time, you will have a complete backflow of information. And this is called uh, quantum safe, or no Markovian safe. And in that context, actually witnessing that you're doing some no Markovian evolution would be useful before actually implementing this thing and selling commercially or something like that. So there, there are some things for which no Markovianity is useful, and once you, something is useful, you want to know whether it's happening or not. <laughs> but I was thinking, but is it really useful in the sense that is anybody selling this, for example? Uh, this I really don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, in this case, it, it seems that it's not that much of to experiments or even practical, right? I mean, I wonder how come, but there's so many people working on it, right? I mean, so yeah. I wonder what would be some motivation or I mean, I, I guess you would need like high level of engineering of your environment to actually have a non Markovian evolution that is useful for something. And I don't know whether that's possible or, or feasible or not. Yeah. Uh, then I don't know if practical to interpret Yeah. So you could imagine that if you can read it, say, a memory, it should be for it. You could imagine that if you're reading a memory, say, then having a non Markovian memory can be useful in certain regimes in which you know that if you wait some time, you lose a lot, and if you wait a bit more, you actually do get something back, right? So, I don't know. Practical to me, so. Who starts this field? There's typically a thing such as quantum, quantum information theory, right? I mean, so all over the 60s, he was already calculating channel capacities, and I don't think there was any uh, motivated, right? I mean, who knows what he was doing? Nowadays, he has a motivation, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, as I was saying, it's like, for me, uh, I will, will upset at least one of the co-author, but for me, no, no Markovian is not that interesting. It's like, w what is interesting is that you have something that was considered as purely uh, dynamical uh, as a feature of your evolution, and now you can write it in terms that are completely statistical. So you take your feature information that, as I was saying, is like comes from how locally states differ from each other. And then you say, okay, evolutions that behave in this way with respect to this uh, statistical distance are the same that other people define in another context as Markovian. So it's like this connection for me is more interesting. 